This is Apostle Bergen, and I thank you for joining me. Um, this is our third day of my seven-day journey, uh, talking about purpose, the seven principles of purpose, living in your purpose, uh, how to exist and live um, a happy life, a purpose-filled life, a purpose-directed life, um, a life that is just governed by the, the power of purpose, and a life that enjoys the freedom of purpose and it is for that reason that I actually gave my my book that name um, the power and the freedom of purpose and the book is available on Amazon amazon.com for those of you who have uh, interest who would like to and I do hope you 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 really would support the, um, the this this project by going to amazon.com and buying a copy of the book and share it with other people um, we have covered so far the P, the first P in purpose, which is plan, prepare, produce. You have to plan, have a plan, you know, have a, ski, uh, uh, a schematic idea, have a, uh, a diagrammatic idea, have something that you can relate to that makes sense. Then you gather up the resources you need, the people you need, you, you connect with um, the places, the centers, the institutions, and so on that you need. And you activate the, the plan. Um, and the, the res you activate the plan by connecting with the resources. And you put the resources together to achieve your end or to get the finished product. The next thing we talked about was understanding. And that understanding is extremely important because you have to be able to perceive a thing you have to be able to uh, make sense of it, get into the nitty-gritty of it, see how the pieces come together, make sense of the, the details and the extensions and the complications, try to get into the heart of it and make sense of it. And today, our third day, we are now going to talk about the retooling and refocusing. Retooling and refocusing. And so that's the third um, element of uh, our discussion on purpose. Retooling and refocusing. You know, I like to tell this story because I find it, I mean, it's a kind of a, part of it is sad, but the end is, is actually, um, you know, a good end and, and a, um, an instructive end. I like to tell the story of this pastor who uh, bought a copy of, bought copies of my book. I, I mean, this book went through a few uh, versions, different versions. This is the last version and I decided I'm not going to do any more work on it. Uh, but it's a uh, book on purpose and so on. And the third element is retooling and refocusing. So this pastor friend of mine who's now, you know, gone to be with the Lord, he bought copies of the book, run a seminar with members of his church, and then a series of, of seminar um, on the principles of purpose as I outlined them, using each letter of the, the word. And he, he closed down his church. So I saw him... Um, maybe months after and I said hey Bishop I hear that you closed down your church what happened um, you know how are things going with you and what happened and so on and I hear you closed down the church and he said to me he said man is the book you know and I said what book he said your book he said but I didn't write my book to close down church I mean what do you mean and he explained to me he said when he got to the um, the, the chapter the third chapter in the book that deals with retooling and refocusing and he really assessed what was going on in the church and he realized there were some members in the church that were really, they didn't mean him well and they were not, they were not really working to build the church. They were really working to destroy the church as, as such. He just showed up one Sunday morning. No, I never he heard anybody do anything radical like this. He just showed up one Sunday morning and he tell them, listen, this is the last service that we are having after church today. You could go where you want to. We're not having any more church after today. I mean, and that's how he closed down his church, you know. Now, about a year later, um, or two years later, yeah, I think it's two years later, uh, he called me up and we sat down and we talked and so on. And he said, man, you know, I'd like if you can give a donation uh, because I'm reopening um, a new church and so on. And I said, oh, that's nice, you know, so on. And we talked about that. Long story short, he reopened a new church, new leadership, new people, and then he actually set um, a nice leadership structure in place. And uh, after he did that, um, 
he, he put somebody in place as his replacement. God bless you, brother um, <laughs> Bramble. Uh, he put he put some new leader in, he, he put a new leader in place, and then that person was he was grooming the person, and then he died suddenly. You know, had some complications and so on. He died, and that person took over the church. And today, this is now about um, ten years later. He's actually the church is still going very well, and so. I love to tell that story, and it's the most dramatic um, story that I have been told about um, how my book have, uh, has impacted people's lives, um, this book on purpose. And today we are dealing with that third principle, which led this pastor to shut down his church and reopen it um, two years later. The principle of retooling and refocusing. Retooling and refocusing <coughs> at the heart. Sorry, at the heart of it, what it really is saying is sometimes we become rusty. Sometimes you lose your edge. Sometimes you lose your touch. Sometimes you don't feel the drive anymore. You don't feel that things are making sense anymore. You, get, you, you can get to a place in your life where you feel that you have given your best, you have done your best, you have been to places, especially if you have traveled around the world or you have, you're a person who was involved in um, maybe multi-level marketing or multi-national um, corporations um, or whatever the case may be. So you have traveled, you have met people, you have stayed in hotels, you have dined with, with the rich and powerful, um, you have interacted with the uh, commoners. And so you've, you've had a life, you've done things um, you've tried to make your impact and then you get to a point where you feel stuck. What next? What do I do? Um, why don't I feel the drive for something I used to enjoy anymore? Um, this doesn't, it's, nothing is making sense. So what happens is some people shift into depression, um, some shift into bad habits. And, and I want to tell you something about bad habits. Bad habits are very easy to, to pick up and they stay with you. You know, um, it is said that if you have a habit and you take off the H, you still have a bit. If you take off the A, you still have bit. And after you take off the B, well, you get the point. You still have it. Um, and, and that doesn't sound very hopeful. And I don't mean to, to say something like that that doesn't sound hopeful. Because I'm going to tell you the other side of it is that one of the ways or the, 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 the way, not just one of, the way that you get rid of bad habits is to create good habits that are counter to the bad habit. So um, you're doing something that you don't like, then you just start doing the opposite. And it becomes a little difficult initially, but you just keep working at it. And as you work at it, um, after a while, because it is a good habit, you actually start enjoying it and you can stick with it. Because the truth be told, um, humans have... Uh, the, what, what we call in, in religious language the flesh and we talk about the spirit every human has that and um, now I know we could go into talking about the intellect and all that sort of thing and um, a few days ago I talked about that by the way you know that we have these five dimensions to us the uh, spiritual uh, phys uh, spiritual, physical intellectual, emotional and social you know we have that so you have to Deal with each part of yourself. But for now, what I'm saying here is that we have this spiritual side. We have this physical side. The physical side loves, enjoys, and holds on to bad habits. Because um, the bad habits are really habits in the realm of pleasure. So they make you feel good. You enjoy what you do. Um, they, they, they stimulate you. They titillate, titillate you. They, 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 they play with your head. Um, you know, you have a high. So bad habits generally are in the realm of the flesh. And good habits are generally in the realm of the spirit. In other words, even when you may not necessarily enjoy something in a given moment, because it is a good thing, within yourself, it brings a sense of satisfaction and peace. It brings a sense of well-being. And so internally, um, when you have your sober moments and your reflective moments, it makes sense to you. 
and you say, well, why can't I choose to do that all the time? You know, that's, that, that kind of dialogue you have going on in your head. Well, every time I do this, it actually makes me feel better. And it actually works out well. Why don't I do that all the time? Well, the thing is, you have to create it as a good habit. So, so here is the, the point I'm making here is that sometimes people are doing things. I right, Joyce Lane? Sometimes people are doing things and um, it is not making sense after a while. And sometimes even after you've had a lot of pleasure in things, it comes to a point where you say, is this it? Is this all there is? There has to be something behind this. You know, I heard this story um, some time ago. I don't remember the fella's name, but he was a, a, a sports um, professional. And he rose to the top of the game, became the MVP, uh, was really doing well and, you know, admired, looked up to almost worshipped. Uh, you know how it is with some of these um, folks who are at the top of the game in sports and, and uh, music and so on. And he called for um, a preacher man who, a preacher who was, who was um, you know, he, he had listened to the, this man over a period of time. And, you know, he was just in a state of, you know, just kind of discomfort and misery. So he called for this preacher and he said, you know, I'd, I'd like to meet up with you sometime for lunch. So they met and so on. And you know what his question to this preacher was? Why didn't someone tell me that it is so lonely at the top? And why didn't someone tell me that when you get to the top, you still have the desire to go further, but realize that you are at the top? I mean, that's a really interesting and, and, and um, you know, eye-opening uh, thought and, 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 and um, inquiry. You get to the top. You are at the top. You know you are at the top. But then you feel that something is missing and you wonder, well, what is missing? What next? Where do I go from here? And um, it is lonely at the top because, you know, I'm at the top, but what else is there to do? And, and you know, um, who do I look up to? Because everybody's looking up to me. And so that's where you, you can find yourself after you've done all that you are trained to do, you are gifted to do, you like to do, you, you, um, you, you, you entrepreneurially um, set out to do, and you get to that point and say, what? Now, that's the point at which you need to, to do the two things I'm suggesting, or the two things that I, I, I have as the principles in my book, um, retooling and refocusing. The retooling part is that you have to now ask yourself, what new skills do I need to acquire? Or I've been really good at something that I've done for the last 30 years, and man, I know that I don't have the edge anymore. I know I'm not as good at it anymore. So now you say to yourself, all right, hear what? It's time now to um, go back and Retool, go back and learn something new about a thing I've been doing all along. So that's what retooling is all about. It is saying, I know that I am not the best anymore. Or sometimes what happens is that the thing that you were really good at, um, that field has, has evolved. And you now, are, you were really good and at the top of your game, but you are now uh, at the bottom of your game or somewhere in the middle because in that field, uh, there has been progress. Simple example, and I'm sure you can identify with this. The example of mechanics. That there was a time when I mean, you take your car to a mechanic and, you know, he would change this, change this, try this, try this, or depending on the song or depending on what he sees or if oil is dri dripping, whatever the case is, he may tell you, I think it's this, that, or that, and he may change those things, tighten them, or whatever he has to do to them. Now, when you, take, when you take a car to a mechanic now, um, a lot of cars now have, have long passed that. Any car you meet now with just very basics and they can just tell you this or that is wrong is uh, most likely an antique of some sort. So now what you really have is the new cars, new uh, upgraded cars, where now they would hook up computers to the car. And that computer can read everything in the car and tell them what needs to be fixed or repaired or, um, or, or upgraded. That's, uh, that has now made it very difficult for many mechanics, uh, especially some who may have been older, and now it's hard for them to learn a lot of new things. 
So now you have to have a lot more new, uh, younger mechanics who actually go and study and are really good at what they're doing and they come back with the more technical side of, of, of mechanics. That's an example of um, retooling that sometimes you have to go back and upgrade yourself. So maybe you were in tourism, maybe you were in uh, education, maybe whatever you are, and now you realize, no, I got to go back and upgrade. So that's one. Refocusing now is um, this, the, the case where you decide that perhaps what you have been working on all along is not the thing that you have to stick with for the rest of your life. So now you have to decide, I need now to refocus. I was focusing on being a good um, lawyer or, or doctor or teacher or mechanic or whatever. You know, perhaps I now need to focus on, uh, if I'm a doctor, probably I need to now go into research. If I'm, if I'm a mechanic, perhaps I now need to go into um, uh, look at getting a job in a car dealership. If I was, uh, um, let's say, a good um, sanitation worker, I now probably need to go and look at uh, doing a, a certificate course in um, waste management. You know, so you have to sometimes refocus. So notice, notice what just happened there. That you are in a certain field and refocusing can mean that you uh, stay in that field but you change lanes in that field so you are not functioning in the thing that you were doing all the time yes again i refocusing you are not um, staying in that field that you are staying in the field but you are not staying in the job or the particular career path you are refocusing so you are, you are, you are turning your skills from one direction to a different direction. So we focus and we tool. That's what I'm talking about um, today. And this is, uh, again, just to remind you, this is our third day in my series, Purpose 777, um, that I'm sharing with you on the seventh month, uh, beginning on the seventh of the month, for seven days, I'm talking about the seven principles of purpose that I have written about in my book. So let me move to share with you that there are four handicaps in life. And people can add to the list, I'm sure, but there are kind of basically four handicaps in life. And this, this is um, addressing the question of why are people not refocusing or retooling? Or why are people stuck where they are and, it's, and, and can't... Um, find neither the drive nor the energy nor the know-how to move because they very likely are experiencing one of four things four handicaps in your life one poverty poverty and I'm not giving them necessarily in order of importance but poverty can pretty much take the first the first um, spot easily poverty can take the first spot there is something interesting in, um, in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter uh, 10, verse 15. I always love this verse of the scriptures. It says, The wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but, the poverty, but poverty is the ruin, or some versions say the destruction, of the poor. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city but poverty is the ruin of the poor so when you are rich wealth puts a wall around you when you are poor poverty brings destruction confusion burden sickness all kinds of bad things in your life when you are rich Wealth builds a wall around you. When you're poor, poverty brings destruction in your life. So I'm talking about the four handicaps now. Um, and remember our main th um, theme for today or of uh, the principle on which we're focusing today is we're focusing and retooling. And I'm saying to you, I'm, answer I'm ask answering a question here now. Why 
do people not refocus and why do people remain stuck? And my answer to you is that we remain stuck and we do not refocus no matter how gifted and skilled we are because of four handicaps in our lives. One is poverty. Number two, superstition. There are some things you believe that are not true. And there are some things that um, we tell ourselves that are not true. And because we tell ourselves these things are not true, what happens is that they become mental blocks for us. They become barriers. You can't get past some things because your parents told you certain things and you believe them. Or because you tell yourself certain things about you and your subconscious mind has so embraced them that you now can't go beyond where you are. You can't move. You're stuck. So um, superstition. Sometimes you believe that if you do certain things, that those things will um, affect you negatively, even though there you don't have any proof, but you just believe them. Superstition. Superstition, of course, you know, are simply things you believe to be true that are not true. Whether it's things in your faith. Brother Dennis, so good to see you, man. Whether there are things in your faith, or whether there are things in the church. You know, um, now I'm going to give you an example. And I don't know if I should give you the example because there are some conversations I have with my wife that um, I don't share them outside because I'm not sure people could handle them. But recently we were talking about all of the, the looting and the, um, all of the looting and the, the, the uh, protest that is going on around the world. And I said to her, I said, some people would prefer to have a Bible without the Old Testament because in the Old Testament, there's a radical God you find in the Old Testament. And I said to her, have you realized when you read the story of, in the book of Exodus where Moses, God sent Moses to deliver the Hebrews from slavery, from bondage. And God told Moses, hear what you do. Tell the people. Borrow all the, the gold and the silver and the precious minerals from the, their oppressors. Because tomorrow, I'm going to lead them out of bondage and I'm going to take them out of this place. <laughs> I saw what you see where I'm going with this. Now, you either believe the Bible or you don't. You either think that it makes sense or it doesn't. Some things in it are hard. Now, so I said to her, I said, no. God told Moses to tell the people, I say, either that the Bible is not true or that something is wrong about this picture or there is something important that we need to learn from this picture. I said, do you realize that there was no way for the Hebrews to return those things after they borrowed them? Do you realize that, um, and then we move to another step now. Do you realize that those um, people who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness, so it is their children who had a chance to enter the promised land, which, which means that there is no way their children was going back to Egypt because they would have heard the horror stories of the slavery that their parents were under. Even if they were to go back, the people who their parents borrowed the stuff from already dead. And then even if they were to go back, they, would, they may not have known what to what to carry and who to give back what to so i said do you realize that what god was doing was getting the oppressed people to take from the oppressor what the oppressor had them to produce so that it could become theirs and they could go with it and it's theirs forever now that's not easy to take but if you if you grow if you if you if you came up with certain um superstitions then those superstitions could prevent you from doing things that are um, advantageous for you and things that would help you to break out of the bondage that you have been in i'm talking about four handicaps and remember we're doing purpose and i'm on my third principle the third principle is we focus and we tool and i'm saying to you um there are there are things that prevent us from refocusing and retooling. Retooling, we're saying, means 
gather up some new skills sharpen up your skills get back in the game refocusing we say means you have your skills you have your gifts but you don't have to do the same thing you were doing all the time you switch to doing something else but you you have your gifts and your skills but uh, and so you stay in that field but you shift into a different area or territory of um, your gifting and your calling and your training and so on. And I'm saying the reason that we do not refocus and we do not retool is because of the handicaps that life that we can have in our lives. The first one I said to you is poverty. The second one is superstition. Now I'm going to the third one. The third one is tradition. Tradition is one of the worst handicaps in our lives. Don't laugh at me, eh? But when I was coming up as a young man, um, one of my struggles and challenges was women wearing pants. Because I, I was taught and I was of the view that a woman not supposed to wear pants because that's not proper and it's not holy. Really, not, that's, not, that's that, not that it's not proper, it's that it's not biblical, it's not holy. Because a woman is wearing a man's clothes, that sort of thing. Or that a man should not um, have his hair long because, you know, this is so sinful and so on. These are some of the things you're taught. And again, in my case, I grew up in, a, in, a, in one of the older denominations. Um, and a lot of these older denominations, they are so strict about um, rules and, and, and of outer things. So you could be sinning evermore. But there are certain rules and principles that if you keep them, you know, out of things, you know, so the colors for certain Sunday in church and, uh, um, you know, you, you wear white on communion Sunday and you do so and so. And, and a lot of people, and I'm talking just church now in general, a lot of people are abused because of traditions. A lot of people are abused because of traditions i want you to write this down if you if you can because it would help you somewhere along the way whenever purpose is not known when you do not know your purpose you will be abused where purpose is not known abuse takes place if you don't know what if you, if you don't understand your purpose people would misuse you abuse you and all sorts of things and if you do not understand your purpose, tradition is one of the key things to, to, to be used to abuse you. One of the key um, uh, uh, tools to be used that is, that is used to abuse people, tradition. Oh, well, you know, we don't do it this way. Oh, well, you know, we always do it this way. And people love to tell, oh, always, we always do it this way. Oh, well, it has never been done that way. Oh, well, you know, nobody does it this way. And this is the right way. Well, this is the proper way. This is the way we have always done it. And, the, and, and you know, the Bible has a lot to, to, to talk about tradition. Um, in, in fact, in the Old Testament, um, one place in the Old Testament, in the, in, in the prophets, God said to, to the prophet to tell the people, listen now, I hate your feast days. I hate your traditions. I hate your new moon festivals. I hate all these things that you bring into me um, to think that these are acceptable. I hate them. So what I really want is for you to do the right thing, for you to take care of orphans, take care of widows, look out for the oppressed, and all this other thing. So he made the shift from what was um, just mere traditions outwardly to say to them, there are some inward principles which if you take in those principles, you will do right and you will treat people the way that they are supposed to be treated. You, you see what I'm saying to you? So, so watch out for traditions. Traditions in church, traditions in your workplace, you know. Oh, well, you know, you are, you are the new person on the job and every, every, um, the newest person always gets to do so and so. And sometimes they set you up because they are trying to, to break you into the club so that you could later on be blackmailed. So do, be careful about, I'm telling you, be careful about traditions. Because there are a lot of wicked and evil traditions that people have that are designed to trap you and to pull you into the club so that now you, you can be blackmailed at any given point. So um, traditions, and sometimes there are family traditions that, you know, well, you know, in our family we always do X, Y, Z. Or it's, um, 
my grandfather, my father used to do so and so, and my grandfather used to. It's a tradition in the family. And there are times when you know that that tradition is not workable for you, or that the tradition is outdated, or that the tradition was based on wrong information, wrong perception, and it was based on somebody's egotistical agenda, and you still hold on to that tradition, it can hurt you. It will hurt you. So tradition is one of the handicaps that prevents us from retooling and refocusing. And the last one, so we said poverty, uh, superstition, tradition, and then the last one, um, why am I forgetting the last one now, is uh, fear. That's the one, and that's the, that's the greatest of all of them. Um, actually, I think poverty is the greatest of all of them. But fear, let me ask you a question, and I want you to ask this question all the time. Ask that question. I'm asking you the question now, and I want you to carry this question with you as you go through the rest of your life if you've never asked yourself this question before. What would I do if I'm not afraid? Ask yourself, you could ask yourself the question the opposite way too. What would I not do if I was not afraid? I wouldn't do certain things if I was not afraid. To not do them I would do certain things if I was not afraid to do those things so what would I what would you do if you were not afraid or what would you stop doing what would you not do if you were not afraid fear is a very powerful um, very powerful challenge and problem but you know what the Bible calls fear don't forget this. The Bible calls fear a spirit. So in the book of, of, of um, James, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. In a, not, not James, Timothy, 2 Timothy uh, 7 verse 1. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a song mind. Power. And that power means the authority and the ability and an innate uh, uh, capability. God has given us the spirit of power. Given us the spirit of love. And what love does, love corrects things. Love makes things possible. Love encourages good things. Love pushes you to be your best. And love allows you or oppresses you to attract what is really good and positive in your life and a song mind so you have balance you have harmony you have direction you can focus right you can um do your best you you can you can aspire to the best you can keep the highest standard a song mind means that nobody could just disturb your mind like that and nobody could just put things in your head just so no one can make you just Think of what you, no, no one can make you just decide to do what you are uncomfortable with, you are unhappy about, you know doesn't make any sense, and so on. Nobody can just make you do that. People can't just put things in your head. People can't have you to just make decisions that don't make sense or serve your interest or your cause. You see? So a song mind. So, so, so always remember, fear is a spirit. And... To overcome fear, some people say, oh, well, fear is just um, false evidence appearing real. I'm sure you all have heard that probably in church at some point. I try to avoid, I personally try to stay away from a lot of church cliches, you know, because a lot of them sound good but don't make any sense. Fear is false evidence appearing real. I, you all have probably heard that. What is false evidence appearing real? Sometimes it's true that something is false and it look real. But a lot of times, and you all know what I'm talking about, man. I know every one of you who are watching me right now know what I'm talking about. That some things is not no false evidence. It's real. And because it's real, it makes you uncomfortable or it, 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 it gives you a sense of trepidation. So it's real. So, so fear is that, is that and, and fear, by the way, is healthy. Now, there's a level of fear that goes beyond just being concerned about something. So, um... In psychology, you know, they talk about fight or flight. So, um, 
when, when you're confronted with something, you're either going to stand up and face it and fight it, or you're going to run away from it. But it is the fear that makes you, um, fear could make you run away, or fear could actually make you fight, because you're so afraid of what could be done to you, that you stand up and you fight it off. So, so fear is, 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 is not just something outside of you. When you say fear is false evidence appearing real, that means you are, you are just thinking of something outside of you that may not be real, that is affecting you. But fear is also an innate um, uh, um, uh, quality and it's an innate um, characteristic of the human being. Like pain, you know pain is not, is not um, bad all the way. There's a certain level of pain that is bad because it's destructive. There's a certain level of pain that is absolutely necessary. Do you know that, um, I, uh, I, I don't know if any of you know the condition, but there's a name for it. There's a name for um, the inability to feel pain. And people, it's a rare condition, but the people who have it, they have to be always watched. You know, if it's a child, for example, the parent has to, has to you, you have to monitor the child all the time. Of course, when a child goes into adulthood, if they still have that condition, they have to be monitored all of their lives. Because if you cannot feel pain, you will stand up on a nail and just stand on the nail there having a conversation. You could go and put your hand on the stove and your finger is being burnt and you don't know. There's a, a name for it. It's a condition. So pain is necessary. Because when you feel pain, that's when you're going to do something about the pain. Um... There's a, a, a my, my, one of my friends, um, my friend, uh, Reverend Cantalupo, told me the story about um, a dog that they had in their family one time. And he saw the dog sitting down on a nail and the dog was, was, was you know, making a funny song because of obviously, the, you know, the, the pain of the, the sitting on the nail. And when he went to, he said, Dad, you know, the, the, the dog is hurting. And um, when he went to pull the... the board that had the nail in it away from the dog the dog um, dashed at him to bite him and his father being the older wiser man said to him son leave the dog alone this is a very important lesson for you he said to he said to my friend he said when it is tired of the pain or when the pain gets too much it will get up remember today is our third day in talking about the seven principles of purpose and i'm talking about refocusing and retooling so here is the application of the story i just told you one of the reasons that we do not retool or we do not change our focus and look in a different direction is because we are afraid and that fear fear is good but fear when it gets to a certain point is now a spirit and the bible says spirit is uh, fear is a spirit god and god has not given us a spirit of fear but my point is when you are tired enough of of being where you are when when there is enough pain in your life and when you are too afraid of where you are going to end up if you stay where you are when you are too afraid of what down the road looks like of what the future looks like when you become too afraid then you are going to push yourself to get up and move from where you are and go into where God wants you to be in other words go into your purpose so refocusing and retooling um, I have five minutes to wrap up you know I, I, I've been doing 45 minutes um, sessions with you and again this is our third day of purpose and we're talking about uh, the Power and the Freedom of Purpose, which is my, my, my book um, that is available on Amazon. But I've been working with you through the um, workbook, which is the Seven Steps to Purpose. When I get to the end, um, in another, this is the third day, so in another four days, I will talk with you about the, um, the, la the steps at the back. There's a seven-step um, ladder at the back. So I'll talk about that when I get to that. But refocusing and retooling, I'm going to now ask you, um, and you know, I've, uh, you, you, you would have noticed that I have a pattern, I've established a pattern where, whereby I take you through some of the questions in the book so that I can challenge you that when, when we finish with each of these seven sessions, 
you'll have some thoughts to go away with and hopefully you have been writing so you'll you'll actually write down some answers to these questions or you'll write the questions and then pursue the answer you answer your questions or something some of them are suggestions and you'll write the not suggestions assignments so you'll you'll write out the assignment and then you'll pursue the assignment with the hope that by pursuing the assignment you are going to see your life change because i give you a commitment my commitment is by the time we get to the seventh day you should have moved beyond where you are right now in your life personally you should have moved further along to one on this discovering your purpose or two understanding the scope and depth of your purpose or three stepping deeper into your purpose somewhere along you got to fit into some place along that continuum so here are the questions i want to ask you now and as i get ready to wrap up where am i now in my life Where am I now in my life? Number two, am I at the place where I want to be? Remember this chapter is on refocusing and retooling. Am I at the place where I want to be? So the first, you can't get to the second question unless you really answer the first question. Where am I now? Oh, well, man, to tell you the truth, I'm just disgusted, busted, and broke. Well, um, I'm at a really good spot right now, but I know there is better and greater. Well, you know, tell you the truth, I'm, I'm not even sure where I am. I'm just a little confused. I'm just kind of trying to figure that question out myself. So wherever you are, you're the one who could answer that question. Where am I now? Am I at the place where I want to be? Now, if you're busted, broke, disgusted, sad, depressed, um, confused or whatever, you, now you know the answer you know you already know the answer to the question is no that you're not happy with where you are so let's go to the next question why am i not where i want to be and how can i get to where i want to be why am i not where i want to be and how can i get there why now remember i gave you four four things that are the four um uh handicaps in life so examine yourself in light of those superstition tradition fear and um and uh tra superstition tradition fear and um uh, poverty examine yourself to, to figure out well i don't have the money well you know man i wish i never told myself so and so and so i wish i didn't believe that xyz would have been the case Where, wherever you are ask yourself why you are where you are and how to get to where you need to be then the next question is what have i done with the opportunities resources and training that i have received and have i put them to the best use i'm not going to ask you the other questions uh, as a matter of fact if you buy the book you can work through the other questions um because in, in and, and i really want to recommend to you that you buy the book uh the, the, it's pretty cheap on amazon i don't remember how much it is quite frankly i really don't i gotta go in and and update some things on on the amazon but um the book is available at amazon.com and the book is really cheap it's the seven steps to purpose workbook i've just asked you three, four of the questions and i'm ending with this last um question i'm going to touch on it just a bit and then close out uh, but there are two other questions under this section and then after that um, there is a, a an exercise that you have to just spend some time in silence and strategically refocus I mean strategically forecast your future so for example here I say um, take 10 minutes to be by yourself in silence turn off the television the radio the iPod the computer and, and all the distractions look at the areas of your life in which you have become rusty so, in other words, the areas in which you know you have slowed down, you have become disinterested, you are less efficient than you were not, than you were not too long ago, and you know that you have exhausted your creativity. So some of the areas might be writing, art, culinary skills, public speaking, your job, your marriage, and so on. All of this is in the book. And, and so what I did, I really tried to give you some strong guidance 
and suggestions and some exercises that would help you to really turn around your life. So let me get back to this question. What have I done with the opportunities, resources, and training that I have received? And have I put them to the best use? What training have you gotten? What education do you have? What skills do you have? How long have you been, have you been trained in a particular area? Have you put those things to the best use? Are you putting them to the best use right now? If your answer is no, then you know that you are not fulfilling your purpose and you are not there yet. If your answer is no, that you, ha you haven't put them to the best use, then your assignment is that you have to look at how do I put them to the best use? What else do I need to do? Or what do I need to stop doing? Where do I need to focus? How do I need to reposition myself? This is the, I'm, I'm, I'm ending here. This is our third day of um, looking at the seven principles of purpose um, as I put them together. Um, P-U-R-P-O-S-E, seven principles of purpose. We looked at the first P, then yesterday, um, plan, prepare, produce. Yesterday we talked about understanding. Today we talk about refocusing and retooling. And one of the questions I answered today, which I, which I, I raised and answered, is that because, uh, is, is the question of why um, have we not shifted our focus or why have we not upgraded, why have you not upgraded ourselves? And the answer is that we have to look at the four handicaps in life and we have to look at some other questions um, in ourselves and make the adjustments, make the shifts, and step out. And if you do that, you're going to find that you begin to, to have a, a greater sense of joy and peace and purpose, a greater sense of optimism, and you start focusing on a brighter future. The future is bright. Oh, the future is bright. But you got to believe because the world belongs to those who dream. You got to believe. In spite of whatever problems, challenges, and setbacks you have had. Package all of it and bundle it. You know what I tell my church all the time? Do not let any of your experience go to waste. No matter how terrible it is. Do not let your experience go to waste. If you have experienced some great things in your life, if you have experienced some really awful things in your life, there's a reason for it. There's a purpose for it. So ask God. Talk to God. Talk to your daddy, man. As a father, you know. Talk to your daddy. Talk to God. What, what, what should this experience do for me? How should it guide me? What does it mean for me? How do I package it into where you are taking me? Because there are some things in your life that unless you have those things in your life, you would not be directed, shift, shifted, and shaped for, for what um, God has for you in the future. God bless you all. I pray that God would really inspire and anoint you. You know, um, as I'm talking to you now, I'm just feeling that there's a real energy here today. You know, the diff very, very different from the last two days. I don't know how many of you are sensing that, but there's a real energy here today, a real passion. Even me, I've gone over my time, um, the time I set for myself. But there's a real energy. There is a, there is a, I'm, f I'm sensing that there's a stirring. That somebody is being stirred and saying, man, you know, let me get up and let me stand up and do something more than I'm doing with what I've been given. Because it's not finished yet and it's not over. So I pray that God would bless you and keep you and strengthen you. Sister Maxine, I see that. Excellent. <laughs> and that God would strengthen you, bless you and keep you and encourage you and, and uphold you and show you your best self yet. So have a great day. Um, remember, you can pick up a copy of my book on Amazon.com. You can also visit my website at PastorBergen.com. And you can, um, I have an online school. It's called um, uh, Logos, L-O-G-O-S, LogosEducation.Teachable.com. I have about four courses there already, and I'm going to add some others and some other teachers and so on. So you can do the courses on, um, I have an evangelism course, and I have a uh, course on minister for those who want to be professional minister I actually have a course there to help guide you on how to become a professional minister and so forth so there are some um, excellent courses there already and uh, you can also visit my um, youtube channel at christolitics and like the page and 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 um, subscribe all right take care god bless you all god bless you too and uh, have a wonderful day everyone